Greetings. This should be the conclusion of Fruits, Fruits of the Spirit. Take your King James or Geneva Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 5. I guess we're going to start verse 1 and read the whole thing. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the Hebrew roots people, the Torah keepers. This is exactly, this is exactly why the, they hate Paul. They say, well, Paul changed the law. No, actually, Christ changed the law. You see, we couldn't, in the flesh, we couldn't keep the law. We couldn't do it. And I'm going to prove to you by the time we get through reading this. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you're getting circumcised because of the Old Testament, Christ has, it's of no use to you. For I testify, testi Testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in, Christ, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. It isn't circumcision or being uncircumcised that makes a difference. Paul says, but faith, which worketh by love. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. That word love is sometimes translated as charity. Because if you have love, you'll have charity. And if you have charity, you have love. Unless, of course, you're a rich person that doesn't uh, only gives to charities that you sit on the board of for a tax donation, for a tax write-off. That's not love. And there are, believe me, there's people in New York City that give money to the Red Cross and the uh, those kind of places, but they're not, they're not giving out of love. They're just... Oh, it's a tax write-off. And they sit on the board and collect a salary. So they get that money back. Oh, uh, let's see. All right. Verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye, sh that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And that's true. Do you know, in the Passover, God wanted us to go through the whole house and take all the leaven out of the house. All the yeast, all the, the baking soda, get it out of the house. But it wasn't because yeast was bad. Well, let's think about it. What, is, what does yeast do? There's two things yeast do. You've got baker's yeast, which causes bread to rise. Because let's face it, unleavened, unleavened bread is basically like hard crackers. And then there's brewer's yeast, which they use to make beer. Which, a little drinking is not bad. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that those that are heavy of heart, give them strong drink. I believe that means those that are getting ready to die. You know, but uh, drunkenness is absolutely condemned. But the, but the point was, when you go through the house and grab the leaven, basically that was symbolic of us. We're the temple of God. Your bodies are the temple of God. We were to go through our lives, identify the leaven or the sin, 
and get rid of it out of our lives. That's what it was symbolic of. So when he says a little leaven, leaven if the whole lump, I mean, I'm thinking of Passover. In uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 15, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. You see, they were to eat unleavened bread. And leaven is always that I know of. I could be wrong, but as far as I know of, leaven in the Bible was always likened unto sin, being a bad thing. There's actually the parable of the woman with the loaves, and some of the pastors try to tell you that in that instance it's a good thing, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Verse 9, Galatians 5, 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. For I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they even I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Yeah, that's right. Don't use li your liberty for an occasion for the fl to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you love your neighbor, you're going to love the Lord, right? But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Would somebody send the Torah keepers a memo? But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Duh! you're being led of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't going to break any laws. But if you're following the flesh, yeah, you're going to break the laws. That's just the way it is. Oh, Hebrew roots people, they don't get this. This is why they don't like Paul. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, I'm not talking about not taking a bath, it's, uh, believe it or not, the uh, Greek word for pornography that has reference to unclean is a Greek word, pornea. It has reference to sexual uncleanness. And I'm wondering if that has reference to sex with something other than women. I don't know. Could be, could be sodomy. Could be bestiality. I'm not totally sure. Lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, 
You know what's going on in, in, in New Orleans on Mardi Gras? Revelings. Drunkenness. Murders. Oh, yeah. Murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not going to do any of those things. But the fruit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do you ever see Hebrew roots people or Torah keepers? Do they have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Do you ever see that in them? No. All they ever do is bash bash Paul and and say the Bible's mistranslated and and you got to do this and you got to do that. That's all they ever do. Verse 24. Against such there is no law. Those that are led of the spirit there is no law. Those that have the fruit of the Spirit, there, there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You ever heard people say, well, he, he talks the talk, but he does not walk the walk. Oh, yeah, he can talk with his mouth, but he doesn't walk with his feet. Yeah, they talk, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. So this is, that's an old saying. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. All right, that was uh, Galatians. That was Galatians chapter 5. Now we're going to Ephesians chapter 5. You know, Ephesus was a city in Greece. You know, these Hebrew roots people think, oh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Well, yeah, it was, but the New Testament was written in Greek. And the New Testament is a better covenant. Oh, no, no, no. Hebrew roots people say, oh, it's a renewed, a renewed covenant. We got to renew the keeping of the law. Well, you know what? I believe Paul. You know, what's interesting is five in the Bible is oftentimes associated with grace. Certain numbers pop up in the Bible, um, you know, one pops up, the one God, three, um, the uh, triunity, you know, man is body, soul, and spirit. Five pops up for grace. You had um, seven days for creation. You had the 10 tribes of Israel, the 10 northern tribes. You had the 12 tribes of Israel. But the, but the number five pops up a lot when, when the word grace uh, comes around. So here it is. We just read Galatians chapter five. Now I'm going to read Ephesians chapter five. And it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So let's go and read Ephesians chapter five. And Ephesians was a church in Greece in the town, uh, city of Ephesus which was a follower of the goddess Diana. Paul went there and won converts. Verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. As Christ also hath loved us, 
and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You see, when Christ gave us the offering as being himself, as the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, the temple was not only no longer needed, it was, it was, a, it was a heresy, which is why God destroyed it. And matter of fact, I just did uh, God's message to the Jews last night. I found it very interesting that the temple under Nebuchadnezzar, Solomon's temple, and the temple under Herod, when Christ was around, both temples were destroyed on the same day. I thought, hmm, what a coincidence. 365 days in a year and both temples were destroyed on the same exact day. Is God sending a wake-up call? Uh, yeah. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And if you want to see what foolish talking and jesting is, watch uh, Maury Povich or um, that Howard St uh, Stern guy on what radio or whatever. Uh, what's the other one? Jerry Springer! Boy, that's... Yeah. Boy, I tell you what, I used to hate going to people's houses and they'd be watching that stuff. I just... Uh, what can I tell you? For this ye know, that no whoremonger, you know what a monger is? That's somebody that desires something. You've heard of, they used to have what they called the fishmongers. That's somebody that liked eating fish. So, uh, perhaps you've heard of a necromonger. Um, there was a movie, what was it, Riddick? Um, necromed. So they desire the dead. So a whoremonger, that's a guy that loves whores. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of it is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Do you know what reprove means? It means to expose. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove or expose them. So, when you hear people complaining about people like us that expose the wickedness of the shack, the movie, the book, or the heresies on TBN or the 700 Prophets of Baal Club, you know, Benny Hinn and that bunch. We're doing what God told us to do. But the devil's children, they can't prove us wrong, so they have to call you names. Oh, you're dividing the sheep. You're being, you know, you're promoting strife. Uh, yeah. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he say he saith, Awake thou, thou awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. 
because the days are evil. Has anything changed in the last 1900 years, 2000 years? No, nothing's changed. The devil's still on his throne until Christ returns. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's good, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's good in my case, because if you heard me singing, you'd be thinking a, a cat was getting strangled. Um, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. You know, Paul's writing this in Greek to a Greek city in Greece. And the words he wrote in Greece, in Greek, in this New Testament, which is written in Greek, when you pronounce the word in Greek, and I've we've got Greeks down here that go to the Greek Orthodox Church. They speak Greek and English. Matter of fact, one of my favorite restaurants, um, the guy... Guy was born in Greece. He knows English. He knows Greek. He reads Greek. He can read the New Testament in his own language. Granted, the language has changed just like English has changed. But if, when you ask them to pronounce Jesus, guess what? They say in Greek, Jesus. You know? And Jesus is pretty much a phonetic spelling with English. They pronounce it the same way we pronounce it in English that they do in Greece. Now, granted, you might say the, they might say the, they, we might say Caribbean, they might say Caribbean, we might say laboratory, they might say laboratory, we might say schedule, the English might say schedule, it's the same word, okay? But Paul wrote... Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't write Yeshua. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Oh boy. This is the most hated verse that I ever read in, in weddings. I always had women tell me, oh, you can't read this verse. But I want you to read the verses after this. I'm like, no, not going to happen. You want me to read anything in Ephesians about husbands love your wives? I'm going to read this too. That's just the way it is. It's a package deal, girl. I had women get mad at me. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. See, they didn't want me to read that. But they wanted me to read verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water, by the word. Well, Christ was the word of God. He spoke. He was the word of God. And the washing of the word, right? When the soldier stuck the spear in Christ's side, what came out? Water and blood. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. Let's face it. Christ loved the church so much. He gave his life for the church. That's how much husbands should love their wives. But you know what? There's going to be a lot of women that go to church. They're going to go to hell. Because they, won't, they will not submit themselves unto their husbands as unto the Lord. I've heard women say, oh, I don't want no man to rule me. Well, guess what? you're not going to let your husband be the boss, 
you're not going to let Christ be the boss either. So you can have Satan, a man, as your boss. I've seen it too many times. I did weddings for at least 10 years. It's sad. I've seen women divorce their husbands because they didn't want to let them wear the pants in the family. And then they get remarried. And then the little children, little boys, crying at the, the remarriage that, I want my daddy. And all the families telling the kid to shut up. I tell you what, I'm as, I should never perform those kind of weddings. I should have been more, I should have asked a lot more questions. May the Lord forgive me. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might, sanct that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. We are men of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence or respect, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. All right, let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 6. You know, Adam was created on the sixth day. The mark of the beast, the number of the mark of the beast is 666. You know, the, whoever did the chapter divisions in the Bible and assigned chapter numbers to the Bible, I I just, I, I strongly believe that uh, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. I really do. It's just numbers in the Bible. It's, it's an interesting study. Uh, I know there's people that try to do secret codes with the numbers. Well, you know, Satan takes a truth and always tries to corrupt it never fails always you know satan will take the liberty that we have and grace and turn it into wickedness but you know if you're led of the spirit what can i tell you all right let's read revelation chapter six and i saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and i heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying come and see and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Remember the great red dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan? That's in Revelation 2. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. War. Uh, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Well, a penny was a day's wage back in the days of Rome. Uh, it was a, well, a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. And a measure of wheat is basically a loaf of bread. So basically it's telling you here that you're going to work all day for a loaf of bread. 
Verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they, who's they? The souls under the altar that were slain for the word of God and the testimony. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, this verse in and of itself destroys soul sleep, which is what the Christadelphians believe and the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's W-I-T-L-E-S-S, -S. they have no wits, they have no brains, they mindlessly follow the watchtower, they don't read their Bible except for their, their junk Bible studies. But this right here tells you and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. What was killed? Their bodies. But they still had a soul and they still had a spirit. Man is a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. And God made man in his image. And if man has three parts, how many parts is God? Father, Son, Holy Spirit? That's what I read. And I saw, oh, I'm sorry. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. If they're soul sleep, how can they be crying and, and speaking? They can't. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood. Listen carefully. And the stars of heaven... Sometimes stars are, angels are used uh, as, stars is used as a figure of speech for angels, oftentimes. I'm not saying this applies in this instant, but it could be. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And this is why I'm reading this, this chapter, is because of this verse here. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a, as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now just remember, Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Oh, yeah. Just remember, you go to work, you get a paycheck. Well, guess what? Sin has a paycheck, too. For the wages of sin is death. 
Ah, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Philippians 1 and verse 11, we are told, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. All right, let's turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, be, uh, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is the 144,000. Sorry, I don't think it's going to be the Watchtower people. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Harpers harping with their harps. Say that real fast five times. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first roots unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication hmm. there was a babylon in nebuchadnezzar's time that took judah into captivity and it fell and the bible said it would never be rebuilt or inhabited well babylon is fallen is fallen well, if it was destroyed and was never to be rebuilt, how could it be fallen twice? Well, there was the physical Babylon, and then there's the spiritual aspect of Babylon. Matter of fact, the Jews have a book that's called the Babylonian Talmud. Talmud means learning. So that is Babylonian Babylonian learning or learning from Babylon. Think about that next time you read about Mystery Babylon the Great. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Full strength, people. The wrath of God is poured out full strength. No mix, no mixing. They're not going to cut the drink. You know, you put a shot of whiskey in a glass and you pour some soda or water or whatever. Uh-uh. No, you're going to get full. They're going to get full strength. The same shall drink of the wine. Wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Indignation's extreme hatred, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, you know, the Bible tells you that the man of sin is going to sit in the temple of God. You know, everybody tells you that this is Rome. 
I mean, come on, people. The, the Antichrist is not going to set himself up in Rome. I mean, think about it. I mean, the Pope is a type of Antichrist. But, you know, the beast is... The beast is going to want to rule from Jerusalem. That was God's city. Isn't that what Satan wants to do? He wants, he wanted to, to rule heaven. But sorry, that job was not available. He was kicked out, and he comes to earth. And now he knows that Jerusalem is going to be God's capital on earth. Why is he going to go to Rome? No, it's going to be Jerusalem. Now, I did an entire study on Mystery Babylon the Great. Who is it? Um, I did a small study on it. If you want to uh, know Mystery Babylon the Great and do an in-depth study, Chris White uh, has an extremely detailed study, very scholarly. I, I admire him on Mystery Babylon. And no, it's not Rome. It's Jerusalem, people. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. See, there's going to come a being that's going to, he's going to claim to be God, and he's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, there's a group of people called preterists, and they say, oh yeah, this, was ha this happened in 70 AD when the Roman armies destroyed the temple. That happened in the past. Um, yeah, but in the book of Revelation, it says that the, the beast and the false prophet were going to be able to do miracles and bring fire from the sky. And I do Bible studies on this very thing, on end times. Take a look at my end times playlist. You know... No, it didn't happen in 70 AD. It did not happen. They didn't, the Roman general Titus did not set himself up in the temple that he was God because he was a general. His father was the emperor of Rome. You don't, you don't have a son tell the fa his father, the emperor of Rome, that he's God and his telling his father that he has to worship him. Preterists are fools. Don't listen to them. The Jews are going to ha the Jews have to rebuild the temple. It, 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 as far as I can tell, they have to do it. And there's two groups that want to do it: the Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Institute. Temple Mount Institute, I don't know. There's two big groups. And let's face it, they want to do it. So, Let's go back to Revelation 14. Ver, well, yeah, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, oh, did we, did, uh, did, did we worship the beast and take the 666, the mark of the beast, in our hand or in our forehead in 70 AD? Uh, no bunch of idiots, preterists. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Tell that to the pre-tribbers, because they don't believe this. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. 
here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Mm. So if we do good works, they're going to follow us. Isn't that nice? And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and is in his hand a sharp sickle. What's a sickle used for? Reap. And another angel came up, uh, came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. It's time for harvest, people. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And that's what you do when fruits are, are ripe, right? You, you, you reap. You harvest. All right, verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, not the one on earth, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Remember from the previous study, uh, Grapes was the symbol of Israel. You know? God's going to reap the harvest of Israel. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress, out of the winepress, even under the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's a lot of that's a lot of blood. So this is the harvest, people. All right, so God is going to press those bad wild grapes, gather the good grapes. So let's take a look. We're getting ready to close this out. Philippians. Philippi, another city in Greece. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. We are told, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. See, our righteousness is by Jesus Christ, not by what we do. And then in Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. All right, everybody, this is the conclusion of Fruits and Fruits of the Spirit. I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, this is uh, Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.